Football is a contact team game which imposes heavy physical demands upon players. Its high speed, aggressive nature of play and the large size of, size of the teams contribute to the frequency with which injuries occur. There is a marked relationship between such factors as age, the level of skill and fitness and the incidence of injury in football. Because physical injury constitutes the principal hazard associated with football, it is essential that all coaches have an adequate understanding of the methods to prevent and manage injury. There are three basic mechanisms by which injuries can occur in football. Injury due to external forces arises when contact or collision between players occurs and this may be the consequence of legitimate or illegitimate accidental or intentional acts. Falls causing injury upon striking the ground and collision between players and goalposts or boundary fences are other methods of injury from external forces. The typical types of injury sustained are concussion, fractures and soft tissue bruising such as the corked thigh. Injury due to internal forces results from such forces acting upon muscles or joints. Tearing of muscle fibre such as when sprinting, accelerating or kicking are typical examples. Disruption of fibres of ligaments turned a joint sprain, sometimes associated with injury to intrajoint structures, such as the cartilages, occur particularly when changing direction or upon landing after leaping. Repeated or unaccustomed use of muscle, tendon or bone results in injuries to these structures, causing inflammation of tendons or tendonitis and stress fracture. To prevent or minimise the risk of injury is a cardinal principle to which every coach must always adhere. The methods by which such an aim is sought may be divided into those which apply during team preparation or training and those applicable during team participation or competition. As adequate medical and physical education expertise is available to very few teams in Australia, in practice this evaluation becomes the responsibility of the coach and includes just simple objective assessment. Conditions such as excessive fatness, poor muscle development, tight hamstrings, foot problems, physical immaturity, poor eyesight, poor personal hygiene such as diet, sleep, smoking and alcohol and previous injuries should be rectified whenever possible or referred for suitable professional advice. As a basic rule, the greater the skill of a footballer, the less is his risk of injury. In addition to basic football skills, the ability to land or fall correctly, to ride a bump, to adopt protective body positioning, to tackle and to evade tackles, are skills that can be learned by constant practice. Coaching can significantly improve these protective skills, greater gains naturally being possible in the poorly coordinated player. No single factor influences the liability to injury of a player or a team more than its fitness. This must be specific for both football and for the tasks allotted the player. Fitness achieved solely by running or by exercising in a gymnasium is not suitably protective in match conditions. Furthermore, the degree of fitness adequate for a position player such as a halfback is insufficient if such a player is selected to play as a ruckman. A balance of strength and stamina, of suppleness and speed are necessary for football fitness. Fatigue with a resultant incoordination is an important cause of injury in the later stages of a match, particularly in players who are unfit. Perhaps the greatest risks are taken by unfit, untrained adults who attempt to play the infrequent social game of football, often after a liquid lunch. Graduated training loads 
and this is an important source of injury preventive advice which all coaches must adhere to. For sudden changes in training loads and conditions greatly increase such risks. Overuse syndrome injuries such as tendonitis predominate, although injury from internal forces, especially muscle tears, do occur. The frequency, duration and intensity of training must be gradually increased, particularly pre-season. The type of training, the suitability of footwear and the surface upon which it is undertaken are features to be noted. During participation of a team, the first feature is that of personal protective devices. And unlike many other sports based on high speed and physical contact, football has evolved as a game played with the barest minimum of protective equipment. As a consequence, footballers tend to be reluctant to use any additional protection. One device which is essential for every footballer over the age of 10 years is a mouth guard. This must be custom made by a dentist to exactly fit a player's mouth. The cost of fitting a whole team with this type of mouth guard is approximately the same as that which would be needed to replace one front tooth knocked out in one player during a game. In addition to protecting the teeth and gums, mouth guards reduce the incidence and severity of concussion, lessen the risks of fractures of the lower jaw and protect the lips and cheeks from lacerations caused by teeth being driven through them by a blow. Shin guards provide valuable protection, particularly for those players with greater risks of receiving kicks in this region, such as Ruckman. Despite the attitude that, that shin guards may slow a player, a solid kick on an unprotected shin will do so to a greater extent. Protective strapping and bandaging is a contentious and at times expensive subject. In general, the time spent incorrectly strapping and bandaging uninjured ankles would be far more profitably used to strengthen and stabilise same. This is the application of protective strapping to a previously injured ankle. The first method used is to apply the stirrups with non-stretch adhesive as shown. This is then locked in place with a further piece of non-stretch strapping. Stretch adhesive, usually three inches wide, is applied as shown to fix the stirrups in place. And this is finally taped into place. As a sound rule, correctly applied strapping should be reserved to protect previously injured ankles and fingers, although appropriate rehabilitative exercises should not be neglected. Here is the strapping applied to an injury to the proximal or first joint in the ring finger. It is very convenient to tape the injured finger to the adjacent digit as is shown in this demonstration. Finger injuries are extremely common in football and are commonly due to forces applied to them by balls, occasionally by players. Finally, it must be stressed that personal protective equipment should be worn whenever a player is at risk. That is, mouth guards are a must, and that means at practice as well as matches.
general protective devices, these include the padding of goalposts and the maintenance and improvement of the condition of playing surfaces, which are important aspects of injury reducing attention demanded of coaches. Warm up is essential both prior to training and to matches and will reduce the incidence of injury. This requires an activity of sufficient duration and intensity to induce mild sweating, followed by stretching of the various muscle groups involved in running and kicking. Here is stretching the adductors or of the thigh. Now stretching of the calf muscles or gastrocnemius muscle, so essential in running. Muscle stretches should be held for about six seconds in the stretch position. But bounce stretches where the person bounces to and from a stretch position should never be used. Here's a press up to continue the warm up regime. And now the stretch of the hamstrings, perhaps the commonest muscle injured in football. Stretching the hamstring. The importance of rewarming after half time and following long winded addresses by coaches at training cannot be overemphasized. Adequate or suitably warm clothing is essential in cold weather, and sometimes a warm clothing, such as a tracksuit or a robe, should be worn at breaks during matches. The treatment of injury in football starts with the responsibility of the coach. And all coaches should have a prearranged plan by which injuries which are, occur in their team can be managed. If possible, this means the delegation of this authority to a physiotherapist or a trainer. But in many instances, it is the coach himself who must assume this responsibility in addition to his other duties. Methods of management such as examination, uh, immediate treatment and transportation to appropriate doctor, clinic or hospital should be predetermined. Whether the coach or an associate is the person handling injuries, there are two fundamental coaching principles which will minimise the severity of the injuries and hasten the resumption of playing by fit players. Firstly, coaches must prevent aggravation of injuries by not permitting continued participation by injured players. Contrary attitudes will result in longer periods of unfitness. Secondly, coaches should insist that all injuries receive qualified advice and ensure that the prescribed treatment is conscientiously followed. The pathology uh, of injury and repair really means what is happening to the body when it becomes injured and it then re repairs or heals. The essential feature of this is damage to blood vessel which results in hemorrhage and this is followed by the accumulation of tissue fluids. These occur over the ensuing two or three days after an injury and follow both external blows or forces as well as internal forces such as muscle tearing. When an acute injury occurs adjacent to large muscles, spasm of these muscles occurs, which causes increasing pain and after the injury. Different tissues possess different rates of healing, and some, such as tendons, are extremely slow. Muscles that are injured will rapidly waste, as they will if they supply or move joints, which are also injured. The healing processes which start immediately the injury is received, can be hastened or delayed by various physical measures as will be described. In the immediate management of a patient who is injured, unless that player is unconscious, the first action of the trainer or his substitute or the coach is to talk to the victim to obtain a history, that is, the player's concept of how he was injured. This must be done even though the person responsible 
clearly witnessed the injury. Do not touch the player before discovering how did it happen? What region is hurt? Where do you feel sore? Was there a crack, a snap, a rip, a tear? Did something give way? Is it painful? Is it numb? Is it weak? When examining a player, this begins with inspection. While you are talking, observe, is there any swelling or deformity? Is the limb in, ab in an abnormal position? Compare the injured with the uninjured side. If there is no obvious deformity, ask the player to move the injured part. This is active movement performed solely by the player. If, do not assist. Only then should the player be examined by palpation, or that it means by feeling. And the injured region should be examined with great care, gentleness and confidence. Distract the anxious player. Do not cause unnecessary pain or discomfort. Is there any tenderness, swelling or deformity? Always compare with the uninjured side. Unless a fracture or dislocation is suspected, assist the movement of the injured area uh, at this stage, but allow the player to regain his feet unaided. Finally, what is the diagnosis and what decision should you take? Should the player continue to play? Will the injury be aggravated by continuing to play? Is the application of cold, together with some reassurance and a little time, sufficient to permit him to resume in the game? Or should he be removed from the field of play? Such decisions are extremely difficult, particularly during the match. Often the removal to a quiet of a dressing room or a medical room will assist in your judgment, but at all times, Avoid expediency and aggravation of the injury. Ensure that the future health and playing career of a player is never jeopardised. Immediate treatment will, of course, depend upon diagnosis. And for soft tissue injuries, the immediate management is ice. I is for ice, E equals compression, and E equals elevation. Ice, the application of ice to an acute injury, is preferably by crushed ice wrapped in a moist, not a wet, towel, or preferably a toweling bag. Here, the dry toweling bag is moistened and properly wrung out, and then will be filled with crushed ice. The availability of ice is an important re prerequisite at all training sessions and at all matches. The ice pack will now be applied to the injured thigh. and then affixed with a cotton crepe bandage. One cardinal rule never to be forgotten is never apply heat to any injury in the first 48 hours. For this will only increase the risk and the severity of any hemorrhage associated with the injured region. To minimize hemorrhage and swelling, compression of the injured region should be performed. Initially, this may be done by the application of an ice pack to the injured region as we have just seen. Subsequently, this is done by the application of cotton wool 
firmly compressed by an elasticated bandage. This maintains the pressure on the injured tissues and reduces further hemorrhage from the damaged blood vessels. The third letter E stands for elevation and elevation of the injured region reduces the blood supply and thus the hemorrhage and the swelling which may ensue and it also assists in the removal of fluid such as blood and tissue fluids draining from the injured part. The unconscious player is an important and dramatic incident in football and conventional first aid features apply. The ABC checklist of unconsciousness is A is for airway, B equals breathing and C equals colour. Ensure that the airway is clear and that it is not obstructed by the tongue, by a mouth guard, chewing gum or vomitus. Check the breathing is adequate and the colour is normal. Place in the coma position with slight head down tilt to protect the airways should the victim vomit and remove from the pl playing arena on a stretcher to seek medical advice. No player knocked unconscious should be permitted to continue playing. Transportation involves the transfer of an injured player to the dressing room, the doctor or a hospital and often commences from the site at which the injury was sustained. A stretcher is an essential piece of equipment at all football grounds and a recently developed uh, highly mobile stretcher called the Jordan frame which is being fitted as shown is an excellent method by which uh, players can be transported from the site of injury to obtain medical attention. Here the frame is placed around the injured player and the slats are commenced to be inserted with the absolute minimum of interference with the unconscious player. After the head, the next slat is placed beneath the shoulders and so on down the body. Severe pain in the back or neck extending into the arms, legs or trunk, inability to move the spine, arms or legs, numbness or tingling in the arms. These are signs which are suggestive of a serious injury to the spine and the potential dangers in moving such a person cannot be overemphasized. In such circumstances, summon expert assistance to move the patient. Ambulance services should be obtained to transport badly injured patients. The pre-arranged availability of a suitable vehicle and personnel with the knowledge of the location of a doctor, clinic or hospital is prudent. Definitive treatment starts with the treatment team and ideally this trio consists of a, a doctor, a team physiotherapist and a team fitness advisor. However, this combination is available to very few football clubs and by necessity it is the trainer and or coach who must assume the day-to-day -day responsibility for the care of the injured in most football teams in Australia today. Beware of the player who acts hardy. A cardinal rule is always to seek more qualified assistance when confronted with any injury or condition about which you are ignorant or unsure. The aims of treatment are to prevent aggravating the injury, to minimise and then remove the swelling, to obtain firm healing of the injured part, to maintain the fitness of uninjured regions, to regain strength, stamina and suppleness, to return to football and finally to prevent recurrence of the injury. Methods of treatment the usual progression is of 
local therapy by ice, followed by contrast baths, and finally heat. Ice, as we've already seen demonstrated, is applied as immediately as first aid in the early stages, and especially if continued bleeding is likely to occur, is maintained over the ensuing 24 to 48 hours. This is then followed by contrast bathing, in which alternately uh, hot, warm or hot and ice cold water is used one minute uh, in each alternate minutes. This is continued until the swelling abates and then heat may be applied. This may be simply done by using w hot water in a simple, in a bucket. As hot as can be stand, uh, stood without causing superficial burning. Infrared ray lamps are also useful uh, and of course in the hands of physiotherapists, ultrasonic therapy as shown here in addition to microwave and shortwave diathermy are important methods of applying heat to injured regions. The maintenance of fitness is an essential part of the recovery process of, in of injured footballers. And it is believed that by exercising uninjured regions, we can greatly improve the blood supply to the injured part and therefore obtain better healing. The type of exercise undertaken will obviously depend upon the parts injured, but cycling is suitable for most forms of injuries and also simple circuit exercises with or without weights may be employed in most cases. The resumption of training and of playing is an important part to reduce the risk of injury in football. One frequent failing is to ignore the need for a graduated return to full activity. Program the type of training to suit the injury and thus for leg injuries this means regaining complete running fitness before commencing to participate in competitive team training. Prevention of recurrence of injury is not always possible and is frequently in the province of the sports physician or sports physiotherapist. Predisposing factors which the coach can detect and remedy include inadequate fitness, muscle tightness or muscle weakness, injury liable playing techniques and the failure to use suitable protective equipment. A player who is sidelined because of injury is usually receptive to such remedial advice. Specific injuries include firstly concussion. This results from blows or forces applied to the skull and indicates damage to its semi-solid contents, the brain. Loss of consciousness is the most notable sign, although may be absence absent in mild cases. Mental confusion, memory loss, dizziness, unsteadiness, headache and vomiting may also be present. As a guideline, the severity of the concussion is roughly proportional to the length of time that the player is unconscious and also to the period of loss of memory for events prior to his injury, which is called retrograde amnesia. Headaches, poor mental concentration, dizziness and inferior sports performance are frequent sequelae. Problems and dangers associated with head injuries and concussion are firstly fractures of the skull, the facial bones or the jaw. Secondly, bleeding into the skull or intracranial bleeding which is a serious and even fatal complication. An important clue is a return of drowsiness and mental confusion after a lucid interval and apparent recovery. A second or subsequent head injury causes greatly increased brain damage and the shorter the interval between episodes of concussion, the more severe are the effects of the second injury. Therefore, a coach must obey the following rules. Firstly, every player who is concussed should take no further part in the game. Secondly, medical opinion should be sought in all cases of concussion. The dangers of fracture of and bleeding into the skull are too serious for any coach 
to assume responsibility. And finally, every player who is concussed is automatically prevented from training for one week and misses one game. More severe episodes of concussion will require a longer period of abstinence. Fractures and dislocations, fractures which are also termed broken or cracked bones, demand medical attention. The features include deformity, loss of power, abnormal movement, grating of the bone ends or crepitus, and pain and tenderness localised to bone. Fractures may be closed or simple and open or compound. An open fracture is one with an overlying skin wound and hence the risk of infection which is a serious potential complication. This injury should be covered with a sterile dressing, bandaged, splinted, and rapidly transferred to hospital. Splinting may be required for unstable or mobile fractures. In the legs, a useful method is to bandage the injured to the uninjured limb, and in the arm, a sling is usually sufficient, perhaps supplemented by an encircling bandage around the injured limb and the trunk, a so-called body bandage. X-rays should be obtained whenever a fracture is suspected. A dislocation occurs when major ligaments of a joint are severely torn and permit the bones to assume an abnormal position. Signs are severe pain in a joint with loss of movement and deformity. As a fracture may also be present, X-rays are essential. Reduction may occur spontaneously or required to be performed under an anaesthetic. Lacerations involve tearing or cutting of the skin and adjacent tissues and may be complicated by hemorrhage or damage to the underlying structures. Lacerations of the face, particularly the forehead and the scalp, are the most commonly encountered in football. Minor lacerations need cleaning with an antiseptic solution and a clean dressing. A spray-on bandage is often, spray-on dressing is often useful and wound closure may be assisted by a steri-strip or sterile adherent tape applied directly to the laceration to oppose the edges. However, deep and extensive lacerations and those which will inevitably scar should be sutured and after initial arrest of hemorrhage by local pressure and elevation perhaps su supplemented by ice which should be enclosed in a plastic bag medical referral is necessary for such injuries to be stitched. An abrasion is the loss of the uppermost layer of the skin by friction. The wound should be cleaned with a mild antiseptic and all foreign matter such as dirt removed and a dressing applied. Blisters are the result of friction or pressure separating layers of the skin and followed by an accumulation of tissue fluid. Fluid should be drained by puncturing with a sterilised needle and the, lift, the roof of the blister is left intact. The cores, such as ill-fitting boots, should be removed whenever possible. The corked thigh is a result of a blunt object, such as a knee or shoulder, striking the thigh, usually from the front or out the side, and is perhaps one of the injuries most commonly associated with the game of football. This causes bleeding into the thigh and which may be between the muscles, that is intermuscular, or within the muscles, intramuscular. The latter, intramuscular, tends to be more serious and involve a longer period of recovery. This injury may be graded as mild, moderate or severe. In the mild case, the player usually will complete the game and there is little restriction of knee flexion, that is knee bending. An ice pack should be applied and firmly bandaged to the injured region and after 10 minutes, gentle stretching may be permitted using a calico bandage which, in which the ankle is drawn towards the buttock. The player is sent home with a firmly padded elasticated bandage encircling the thigh and instructed to rest except to perform 10 half squats each hour. He must be warned that should the thigh commence to throb and become increasingly painful and swollen, he must cease squatting, elevate the leg and reapply an ice pack and the pressure bandage. This is because bleeding is continued in, continuing into the thigh 
and the condition can no longer be termed mild. A moderate cork thigh, in this situation the player is commonly forced to cease playing or training. Early swelling of the thigh is visible and loss of knee flexion or bending is commencing. Ice, a com compression bandage, elevation and rest are essential and immediate stretching is inadvisable. The player is instructed to keep the leg elevated overnight and the reapplication of ice packs uh, every four hours is a valuable measure. Reassessment next day will determine the extent to which the bleeding was able to be controlled. Knee flexion of more than 90 degrees signifies the injury is now classed as mild and repeated gentle stretching on ice is permitted and early resumption of training can be anticipated. If knee flexion is less than 90 degrees, more bleeding has occurred probably into the muscles and ice elevation and rest should be continued. Medical consult consultation is advisable. In the severe case of a corked thigh, gross bleeding as much as a litre or more may, of blood may be contained in the tissues of the thigh and much of this will be within the muscles. The whole thigh region may be very swollen, taut and extremely tender. Knee flexion is very greatly restricted and calcification of the deeper areas of the hemorrhage frequently follows. The medical advice is essential and the period of full recovery and return to football can be as long as three or even nine months. This type of injury results either from a great force striking the thigh or from a mild or moderate injury which continues to bleed. Heat, massage and vigorous activity in the, within the first 24 to 48 hours are major causes of aggravating this injury by promoting further internal hemorrhage. So a cardinal rule is never massage a cork thigh in the first week. Muscle tears which involve the tearing of muscle fibres from by forces generated from within the muscle tend to occur in those muscles which span over two joints. These are particularly the hamstring group at the back of the thigh as well as the quadriceps in the front of the thigh. The latter it tends to occur not only from accelerating but also from kicking. These injuries which are some of the most frustrating encountered by footballers are managed by the immediate application of ice and compression to minimise hemorrhage and swelling. Early introduction of stretching on ice is permissible as shown in this case where a torn gastrocnemius or calf muscle it has been iced and is now being stretched. The use of heat, stretching and strengthening exercises to achieve firm healing with full strength and full stretchability within the muscle are important aspects. A gradual return of to full activity and the minimum absence from competition of two matches is usual. Preventive advice as to warm up including suitable stretching exercises is important. Knee injuries are without doubt the greatest cause of premature retirement from football. The knee is an extremely complex joint which is prone to injury on pivoting or swerving, on leaping and landing and particularly when major forces are applied to it from any direction whilst the limb is weight bearing. The diagnosis of knee conditions presents major difficulties to even the experienced sports physician or sports surgeon and should not be attempted by lay persons. The best assurance against the vulnerability of the knee is to develop and maintain excellent strength of the thigh muscles or quadriceps. Here is the use of what's called static quadriceps contractions to contract the vastus medialis or the muscle on the inner side of the thigh which is so essential when the knee is locked. Here is the use of uh, resistant exercises into full extension with a weighted boot on the foot to restore and maintain and strengthen the condition of the thigh muscles. Ankle and foot injuries <clears throat> Numerically, the ankle is the most frequently injured region in football. For anatomical reasons, this is more vulnerable to injury on the outer or lateral side than it is on the inner or medial side. The standard methods of treatment, as have been described in earlier parts of this lecture, are 
applied to the management of ankle injuries and often when conscientiously followed will result in dramatic improvement, restoring a good range of movement to the joint and adequate strength of the supporting muscles are essential for recovery but must be supplemented by exercises to assist in the recovery of the balance mechanism or termed the proprioception of the joint. This mechanism is damaged in most ankle injuries and is a frequent cause of recurrence of such injuries. This is a balance or wobble board on which the player is learning to re-educate his balance mechanism. Correctly applied supportive strapping is an important aid to assist the player to return to sport after his injury, but should never be considered to replace the need for rehabilitative exercises. The shoulder and wrist are other injuries sustained commonly in football. Falls onto the point of the shoulder, particularly the so-called shoulder pointer or a chromioclavicular joint strain is common and it is also, as also uh, fractures of the clavicle or collarbone and dislocations of the shoulder joint. The wrist is also subject to falls, particularly when striking the ground and has a higher liability to fracture than many other joints, hence an x-ray for any wrist injury of any severity is essential. Because of the smaller size and reduced running speed of junior footballers, forces which are generated at the time of collisions or after body contacts are much smaller and the resultant injuries less frequent and less severe. The greater suppleness of the young contributes to a lessened incidence of muscle tears and of course injuries heal faster in children than in adults. Problems which are confined to junior footballers involve the epiphysis or the growing regions of bones. These are located at the ends or edges of bones and are also situated at certain bony prominences which develop to anchor a tendon. Such epiphyses may be injured as a result of a fall or other external forces uh, and these signs mimic those of a fracture. They may also be damaged as a consequence of sudden or powerful muscle contraction such as in sprinting or kicking and, and also with the continued use of tendons which attached to them such as in running. Other conditions which develop in the growth areas are not directly related to the trauma or activity but may necessitate some restriction of football. Finally it should be noted that excessive coaching or parental pressures on junior footballers are psychologically undesirable and may contribute to the incidence of injuries particularly in muscles. The basic first aid equipment which is essential for every football team, uh, is contained in the National Football League coaching manual to which I would refer you. And finally then, in summary, the, the role of the coach in the management of football injury is threefold. Firstly, in prevention. Secondly, in immediate management. And finally, in treatment. And don't forget the ICE, ICE, for ice, C for compression, and E for elevation and rest. Finally, when in doubt, obtain expert medical attention on every occasion in every football injury.